seated. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. The chapter breaks are not inspired of God. Sometimes they're very helpful, sometimes they're not. Um, I would say the chapter break should have been between chapter 9, verses 34 and 35, because verses 35 and through 38 of chapter 9 basically set the context and the, the stage for chapter 10. So I'm going to read it real quick, chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Okay, so this is, seems to be the way that God works. He gives you a burden, a burden, and says, pray that God will send forth laborers into his harvest. And guess who answers that prayer? You start praying that God would send forth laborers into his harvest. And God taps you on the shoulder and said, uh, how about you? Are you available? Uh, you can see the harvest. You can see that there's far more to be done than, is, that, than there are people to do it. Uh, rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Uh, so, this morning, I want you to keep that in mind. There's a great harvest. There's a great work to be done. The laborers are few. So when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, I'm gonna, I want you to compare that with a couple of the verses I'm going to read to you here, and then we're going to talk about it. Acts 1-7, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is after the resurrection, before the ascension, and he tells them here uh, that when the Holy Ghost has come on the day of Pentecost, you will receive power. But here back in chapter 10 of Matthew, he gave them power. In Luke 24, 49, he says, And behold, I send, you, I send the promise of my Father upon you, talking about Pentecost. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. This is between the resurrection and Pentecost. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. John 16, 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. John 16, 7 is between the Last Supper and Gethsemane. Okay? Uh, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Acts 2, 32. This Jesus, this is Peter on Pentecost, preaching at Pentecost. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. So what's the difference? Well, I think there's a key. Uh, at this time when Jesus gave them power, they were under the direct supervision and training of Jesus. He gave them power for a specific application, and evidently it was a temporary uh, form of power, a temporary, the Holy Ghost coming upon them, the Holy Ghost going with them, giving them power, but it was under the direct tutelage of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, then in, in John 14, right after the Last Supper, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, 
that he, that he may abide with you forever, that he may continue or dwell, the word minnow, the little word minnow that we've talked about before, that he may continue or dwell or abide with you perpetually. There was a change there. There was a, uh, a transition from the Holy Ghost being upon them for specific applications and the Holy Ghost dwelling with them perpetually that this promise of the Father that he received after the resurrection and sent forth and shed forth upon his church. And we know from the scriptures that there were some legalities that had to be taken care of by the resurrection of the, the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ before we could receive the spirit of adoption, before some of these things could be finalized. And uh, this is part of it. So the giving of the Holy Spirit to abide with us. He says in verse 17 of chapter 14, after he said that he may abide with you forever or perpetually, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, obviously, in the person of the Holy Spirit. But he also says, another comforter. Okay, so we know, and it's not hard to prove from the scriptures, that the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are used interchangeably. Look, read Romans 8. That, uh, that the Holy Ghost, you lie to the Holy Ghost. Ananias, you lie to God. It says it right there. Used interchangeably. Uh, the, the, the church was purchased with God's blood. Okay? So we know that our God is triune. And, uh, and yet there are things about that triunity that are separate. Jesus said, I'm saying this because I talked to a person who has the oneness doctrine. And they rail against those who have the idea of the trinity. In fact... This last week I talked to a guy in the parking lot, uh, in a parking lot there in Chillicothe, and he said, well, the Trinitarians believe that there's three, and, we, and Isaiah said there's just one God. I said, you're not being just. We, don't, we, believe, we agree with Isaiah, there's one God. But we understand from the scriptures that one God dwells in a triunity that is beyond any human being's ability to fully understand. So quit trying to make an argument about it. Quit trying to cause so discord in the body of Christ because of it. You don't understand it. We don't understand it. But the Word of God declares that you lie to Jesus, you lie to God. You lie to the Father, you lie to God. You lie to the Holy Ghost, you lie to God. You say, I don't understand that. He's God and you're a human being. You know, that's, that's to be expected, right? Um, so anyways, we, there's things we don't understand, but... We do understand that there was a shift in the uh, administration here to where these men had been given power, but it didn't dwell with them perpetually because they were to stay in Jerusalem and wait for it after they had already been given it at one time. Um, and you say, well, I don't understand all that. You don't, you don't have to. You just have to believe what the Word of God says. So we... Thanks to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, when we come to Christ, that comforter, that paraclete, comes and is supposed to continue with us, dwell with us perpetually. It's no, that's no uh, teaching of eternal security, because the fact of the matter is, just because the Spirit of God is supposed to dwell in you uh, continually rather than being for certain applications, okay? I'll give you power on this mission trip. That's a certain application. That's a temporary thing. This Holy Ghost is another comforter that was sent to us because Jesus is not with us. And he sent him to dwell with us and to guide us and to guide his church. If you forsake the covenant, he will leave you. Grieve not the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed. Okay? Don't grieve the seal. Well, if I'm perpetually, unconditionally sealed and nobody can do anything about it, then that's just saying, uh, be nice, but there's really no consequences, you know, big consequences. Oh, God might give you a spanking. You might lose some rewards. That's the way the Baptists go with it. No, the fact of the matter is, 
If you grieve away the Spirit of God that is sealing you, you lose that seal. You are no longer sealed. The Spirit of God leaves you. You're in big trouble. But he is here to dwell in all those who are in covenant with God. Being in the covenant, part of the blessing of that is the Holy Ghost coming into your life, dwelling with you. Now, does everybody have the same measure? No. No. It's very clear that we should be being filled with the Holy Spirit. God will entrust a greater measure of the Holy Ghost to you as you are tested and tried and matured. Um, so let's go on here. Yes, they were given power for that specific mission work that they went on. And then after the resurrection on the day of Pentecost, by the way, Pentecost this year is June 5th. Pentecost is uh, wheat harvest, whereas Passover was barley harvest. Uh, originally, Nisan was called Abib, which means a ripened ear of grain. And uh, after, after the Babylonian captivity, they adopted the Chaldean names for the months, just like we have pagan names for our days of the week. Uh, this is Sunday. Yesterday was Saturn Day. Tomorrow is Moon Day. And that has nothing to do with Christianity. Some people get all upset about it. But the fact is, the Jews... And the scriptures use Nisan and uh, the uh, Chaldean names for the months after the captivity. So Pentecost is 50 days after the resurrection. The resurrection was on Sunday. Uh, 50 days later, you have the day of Pentecost or uh, Sukkot. Um, no, Shav Shavuot. Shav Shavuot, Shavuot is how it's pronounced. That's what the Jews call it, Shavuot. Anyways, chapter, uh, verse 2, chapter 10. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. I want you to keep in mind, uh, we should never deify people like this, but we should also never demean these men. These were men just like you and I. They had families, they had homes. They were little boys that grew up into adults. Uh, they, they were men just like you and I. And they had no idea before they met Jesus how their life was going to change. But let's talk, we're going to talk about these guys because we can learn a lot from them. Um, the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, okay? His name was Simon. Jesus gave him the name of Petro. That means a rock, or Cephas. Cephas is Aramaic for the exact same thing. He was not called rock uh, or stone before Jesus met him. Uh, but Jesus gave him that name, and, and it's interesting, Titus and I were looking it up. Uh, Peter and Cephas, both are the names of Peter. They both, one's Aramaic, one's um, the Greek. But... In Galatians, the Apostle Paul uses both of them. In the same letter, he calls him Cephas and he calls him Peter. Because we were talking, we were trying to, trying to figure out who the Marys are and who the Jameses are is really interesting. There's a lot of challenges. Is, is Alphaeus the same as Cleophas? And then there's also, there's not only Cleophas, which in the Greek is Clopas, but then there's a Cleopas, and in the book of Luke, you have both the Cleopas and the Alpheus. And so I thought, well, it must be two different guys because they use two different names in the same book. And then we go to Galatians and find out that Paul uses Peter and Cephas in the same book. It's like, well, we can't base anything on that. They use those names interchangeably. It didn't bother them a bit. So anyways, Peter and Andrew, his brother, these were, these were brothers uh, it seemed that Andrew was living with Peter at the time that Christ was using that home as his headquarters. And then you have James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. John and James were both sons of Zebedee. You have Philip and Bartholomew. Now, Bartholomew is the same as Nathaniel. The name Bartholomew just simply means son of Tholomew. Bar, just like Bartimaeus, means son of Timaeus, okay? So that was just a family name. Nathaniel was... Is who, they call him Nathaniel in other places. Then you have Thomas. 
Thomas is a Hebrew name that means twin. Sometimes he's, in another place, says Thomas called Didymus. Didymus is simply the Greek form of twin. So Thomas had a twin, whether alive or not, I don't know. We don't know if maybe one of these apostles was his twin. But Thomas was called the twin. And Matthew the publican, it says here, uh, and only in the book of Matthew does Matthew call himself the publican. The other writers, Luke and, and um, Mark and John, don't, don't tag that onto him in, in the lineup of the apostles, which is respectful. But Matthew uh, does put it on himself. Now, there's another instance there because Levi and Matthew are evidently the same person. But I think it's in Luke where he uses both names, Levi and Matthew. So the usage, you can't build a whole lot on that. Okay, so you have Levi or Matthew. Then you have James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. And guess what? Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, is actually Jude. <laughs> um, so it, it's a real interesting study to figure out who's who in the scriptures here, that James, the son of Alphaeus, and Jude were brother. James and Jude were brother. Simon the Canaanite. Canaanite here does not mean he's from Canaan. It means he's a zealot. And in another place, it says Simon called Zelotes. Okay? So he was a Jew. He was not a Canaanite. Uh, he was simply part of a group possibly called the Zealots. The Zealots were kind of like the Pharisees. And... Um, they started out wholesome with good motives and they set themselves as a group of people who were going to see to it that God's law was not violated without uh, punishment, without uh, consequences. And so when they saw someone violating God's law and the Romans were not allowing them to deal with it, they determined they were going to deal with it anyways. Uh, it became a corrupt movement Later on, like the Pharisees did, they started out good, didn't, didn't end up good. So Simon was either one of these, or it's possible that it meant that, they, that the apostles named him Simon the Zealous. Uh, most people believe he was part of a Jewish zealot group before he started following Jesus, so they tagged on that Zelotes. And then Judas Iscariot. Uh, Iscariot means he's, most likely means he's from Kerioth. His father is called Simon of Kerioth in one of the other Gospels. Uh, so Judas and his father had the name. It was Judas. His father was Simon of Kerioth and Judas of Kerioth or Iscariot. All right. Judas then, Kerioth is a village in Ju Judea or in Judah, the tribe of Judah, Judea. Okay. So Judas would have been the only disciple that was not a Galilean. When Judas was eliminated, we find that the disciples were simply called Galileans, or men of Galilee. Judas would have been the only one among them that was of Judea, and his father evidently as well, uh, men of Kerioth, uh, who also betrayed him. So what kind of men were these? Uh, we don't know how Judas started out. What, how he started out, how good he started out, how good he did for a while is totally eclipsed by his ending. Remember that. You can start out good, and you can do good for a long time. You can do a lot of good, and then have a crummy ending, have a lousy ending. You can fail. You can, you can uh, yield to temptation. You can get off the path, and your ending will totally eclipse all the good you did, and you will become known like Judas as the son of perdition, the betrayer, the traitor. Nobody, uh, prior to Judas Iscariot, Judas was a very popular name because one of the patriarchs was Judah, and a tribe of Israel was Judah, and it was a very good name. Jewish boys liked having the name Judah or Judas or Jude. I would 
say that after Judas Iscariot, that name, the, the usage of that name, if you had a graph, probably went shoom. You know, how many people want to name their daughter Delilah or Jezebel? If they do, there's issues there, okay? There's big issues there. Just the same way, you wouldn't want to name your child Judas. You would name him Judah and avoid that. We have Judah here this morning. But the name Judas, you, know, you don't want to use that name. Why? Because if I called you a Judas, would that be good or bad? That wouldn't be good. Everybody say, he's a, he's a traitor. He's a thief. No, but there was a lot of, there was also the Judas, the brother of James, who was an apostle. But if I called you a Judas, they wouldn't think he's an apostle, would they? Judas so marred his name. And it's sad. At one time, he may have been a, a really good fellow. Uh, and remember that. But these were these guys, a lot of people try to paint it as though Jesus gathered these ragamuffin, uh, uncouth fishermen together and made uh, apostles out of them. Uh, they were a bunch of low-down hounds, and they, they probably weren't very uh, religious. Maybe they were irreligious men, but then Jesus banded together and made apostles out of them. That is a, is a, a lousy, wrong view of the subject, Okay. Were they, can we show that they were indeed fervent followers of Torah, upright, honest Jewish men? Were they seeking to purify Judaism? Were they grieving over the corruptions in the nation and the priesthood prior to Jesus calling them? Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 1. I'm saying this for a reason. And so, hold your thumb there in Matthew 10. I want you to understand, John the Baptist had showed up on the scene calling the nation to repentance. His ministry probably had not lasted more than six months, maybe less than six months, okay? Okay? And we find that, that the ones who became the primary disciples of Jesus had already latched on to John the Baptist. John 1, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, he said this, this was 40 days plus, at least 40 days after he had already baptized him. So Jesus came after he turned 30 sometime thereabouts to John, was baptized of him, the heavens were open, the Holy Ghost descended as a dove, and then he went into the wilderness and fasted and was tempted for 40 days. Now he returns to Judea. John the Baptist has been baptizing and preaching this whole time. And um, so he says here in verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, most likely John and Andrew, you will find that the apostles uh, avoid naming themselves in their own epistle or their own gospel um, writing. In fact, John uh, does not name himself or his brother James, or his mother in his epistle. It's interesting. I was going to look to see what John said about James. The word James is not in the Gospel of John, um, as far as John's brother. So this was probably, these two disciples here, uh, one of them, it gives the name of Andrew. It doesn't tell who the other one was. It was probably John, because John's relating the story, and it's only related in his Gospel. Most likely it's him. So... Two disciples of John the Baptist heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. 
Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. One of the two was Andrew. Okay? We can guess the other one was most likely John. Simon Peter's brother. Okay, so Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, is a disciple of John the Baptist. Uh, he's only been ministering, preaching, for six months or less. What does that tell you? These guys were, these guys were tuned in, all right? Um, they had a fishing business in Galilee. John happens to be preaching in Judea. So they are not in Galilee. They're, they're here listening to John, helping John, being disciples of John, and they're, not, they're, not, they're a long ways from their fishing business. Obviously, uh, it was okay with, with the, the boss. Okay, Simon Peter was back taking care of the fishing business. So was Zebedee and maybe James. But they were, they, you, you'll see that when these people meet Jesus, they know who to tell, okay? He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So I take that back. It seems that Peter might have been in Judea at this time as well. And when Jesus beheld him, he saith, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Stone, Cephas, which, being, which is by interpretation a stone. Thou shalt be called a stone. Peter means the same thing, Petro. Um, so it didn't take these guys long to follow John. Jesus divinely knew these men and accepted them right off. The first time he met Peter, he says, you'll be called a stone. Jesus already knew about these men. He didn't say, well, yeah, we'll see if you'll make do. He wasn't out converting these men. These men had already been baptized by John the Baptist. So they had already responded to the Holy Ghost through John the Baptist, and now Jesus immediately accepts them and actually uh, gives them an accolade of, of uh, future greatness. So verse 43, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee. See, he was not in Galilee at that time. And he findeth Philip. Well, Philip was probably recommended to him by these disciples of John, or Jesus just divinely knew who else he was looking for, and saith unto him, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, which is on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, the city of Andrew and Peter. That's where they were all from. Andrew and Peter lived in Capernaum during Jesus' ministry, but they were from Bethsaida, which was up to the north of Capernaum. Philip findeth Nathanael, or Bartholomew, and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law uh, and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. So was there a conversion experience and repentance? And No. Nathanael was already seeking God. Nathanael and Philip and these people, these disciples that Jesus has called were not unconverted, getting converted. We find that Zacchaeus got converted, didn't become an, an apostle. The, the maniac of Gadara got converted, didn't become an apostle. I'm saying this for a reason. We'll get there soon. Um, Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. So Jesus is looking out a group that he already knew about. He's searching out a group of men who had already been prepared in their heart and mind and purposes to fill this role. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter, ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So these guys, this group of the disciples, 
most likely were already disciples of John the Baptist. They were probably already baptized by John the Baptist. They had already uh, had a heart and a life seeking God. You don't say about someone, behold, a man in whom is no guile, and it not be true if you're the son of God. In other words, I've known you for quite a while now. I've been watching your life. And I know that you are solid, you're honest, you're not deceitful, you don't have a feigned faith, you have a genuine faith. In this account in John, we don't have any of the other apostles who would have been possibly relatives, the sons of Mary and Cleophas, okay? Um, there's, it's, it's hard to get dogmatic, and some of these things can't be proved. But the, if these men that were just called, that we just read about in John, it seems were not related and hadn't known about Jesus prior to this. But the call of the sons of Alphaeus and, or Cleophas, um, we don't hear about those calls. And we also, if you, if you compare Scripture with Scripture, it seems that a number of them were uh, cousins or kin. And um, Cleophas, if, if, if Cleophas and Alphaeus uh, were the same person, then Hegesippus, a second century historian, says that Cleophas was the brother of Joseph. Well, we know that when the mother of James and Joseph, or sometimes called the mother of James, was one of the Marys. You had Mary Magdalene, you had Mary the mother of Jesus, and you had Mary the wife of Cleophas. And other places says Mary the mother of James and Joseph. Another place says Mary the mother of James. Obviously the same Mary, it seems. But if Cleophas was the uh, brother of Joseph, it, under, it makes it understandable why the Bible also says the women at the cross, as looking on, was his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas. Well, sister-in-law. And if she was sister-in-law, and Cleophas was Joseph's brother, which Hegesippus said he was, second century historian, then uh, it explains why James and Joseph and Jude and Simon, uh, mentioned as his kin, as his brethren, were really his cousins, and... Uh, that explains why Jesus at the cross did not feel like, well, I'm being taken out. The, her, Mary's other children will take care of her, but he committed Mary to John, the son of Zebedee, which it doesn't seem was related. There's possibly some relation, but it, from the call in John's gospel, it doesn't seem they knew Jesus prior to this, okay, as relatives, whereas you don't, you don't read of the call in the same way of the ones who most likely were his relatives. Just interesting points there. You can go study it out and uh, put it all together and read all the incredible amount of varying opinions yourself if you want to check into it. So we have in John, we have John and James, the sons of Zebedee and, and Salome. Salome was most likely the wife of Zebedee, okay? Um, John in his gospel doesn't mention his own name, or James, or Salome. Um, but Zebedee and Salome evidently lived in Galilee and had a fishing business. They had a fishing business with their two sons and servants. It was quite, a, quite an enterprise. In fact, they were partners with Peter and Andrew. So these, these guys, like, you know, they had their crew. It wasn't a roofing crew, it was a fishing crew. But they went out and fished cleaned their nets, sold their fish. They were a working family. And we find that Zebedee and Salome were tuned in to God. We find that Salome, in a number of instances, is among the women following Jesus. Salome is the one who came to Jesus and said, Grant that my two sons sit on the right hand and your left hand, James and John, sons of Zebedee. Uh, they were tuned in to the Lord Jesus Christ. They were there at the crucifixion uh, supporting Mary, his mother. There was also Mary Magdalene and Mary, the, the mother of James and Joseph, which had been the wife of Cleophas. But Mary, uh, Salome, the wife of Zebedee, was, was often in the mix. Um, 
In Mark 3, verse 17, Jesus surnames James and John Bonerges, which means sons of thunder. Peter, James, and John would have been the only three on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were the only three allowed to witness the raising of Jairus' daughter. And Peter, James, and John were the only three who went further when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were a special group. Uh, Peter and Andrew, Peter's house became the headquarters of the ministry. Philip and Nathaniel of Bethsaida were all were right in there, faithful disciples. What is it? What is it that when the Son of God came into Israel, he's been baptized by John. He, he went to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Listen up. And now he's going to handpick the people who will carry on his life work when he's gone. Is he going to go look for uh, just any old person out there? No, we, got, we have evidence, we have his own word on it, that he chose people who were fit. He chose those who had already been working towards the goal before they met Jesus. You know, I, I read in a headline... Uh, just yesterday, that there was a 22-year-old, I think he was an ex-Marine, uh, he'd actually been court-martialed out of the military for bringing a gun on the base, I guess, but he saw what was going on in Ukraine, he had a wife and a seven-month-old child, and he saw what was going on in Ukraine, he said, I believe in what they're fighting for, I'm going to go over there and help them. He went over there, and I don't know how long he fought over there, but he got killed. He gave his life, his future, to fight for the Ukrainians because he believed in what they were doing. It reminds me of that verse where Paul says, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. This 22-year-old could have lived to be 80, could have raised his children, seen his grandchildren, but he was more concerned about fighting for something he believed in, whether I agree with him or not, whether you agree with it or not, is, is beside the point. He believed in something and gave his life for it. But was there any promise of eternal rewards in that? That wasn't what he was looking at. He just believed in fighting for a cause and he gave his life. So I want to say to you this morning, these men were just people, normal people, like we are people. And I'm going to say to you this morning, there is a position of usefulness and blessing in the family of God for every individual, every single person who wants to be on God's team and and, and do an important work for God and be used of God and lay up rewards in heaven and give their life for an eternal cause. Every individual in this congregation and hearing my voice, there is a position, a blessed position, a useful position if you're willing to pass three tests. Because <clears throat> a lot of people would say, oh, if Jesus were here and he called me, I'd follow him. Really? I want to say to you, not if you're not already preparing to serve God. Not if you're not already on that path. Not if you're not already uh, following God's man. They were already following John. And before John came, who were they following? Before John came along, why is it that John came along and in less than six months, they're his disciples? They lived in Galilee. John's ministry was primarily in Judea. They heard about it. They went and checked it out. They left the fishing business, went down, checked this guy out, and next thing you know, they're on the team. I guarantee you, uh, their spiritual fervor didn't start with John. So 
test number one. Test number one is the test of preparation. There are some people that I've talked to, and whenever you talk about your purposes, your faith, your beliefs, they want to call it your conditioning. Your conditioning. In other words, you're a product of your conditioning. You're a product of what you've been told. It's like, like, like you're a robot and someone has programmed you and you're not, you're not running in your, your own mind. You're just following your conditioning. Well, let me say that there is a truth in that. They want to use it in a demeaning way. But the fact is, they're also following their conditioning. Okay? And the reality of it is, listen up. You need to hear this. Before they became John's disciples, they weren't falling asleep in synagogue. Okay? If you're not already siding with God against the world, your flesh and the devil, you won't respond to the call of Jesus. You won't respond to the call of John. Jesus said in John 6, 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. Okay, and this goes along with the line of your conditioning. By the way, my conditioning is a result of my choices, my decisions, and your conditioning is a result of your choices and your decisions, and everybody is a, is a, a, a result of many tributaries, okay? But those, you, you, you choose who you listen to. You choose when you stay awake and listen. You choose what you take to heart. You choose what you grab onto. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Now we know that the Spirit of God strives with every human being that comes into the world. All those who were flooded out by the flood, the Spirit of God had been striving with them. So what is Jesus saying? No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Yes, the Father's drawing everybody, but what's the difference? He says, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets. So he's going to quote scripture to back of what he said. All right? It is written in the prophets. And they shall be all taught of God. What does all mean in the Greek? All. Every man, therefore, now every man doesn't mean all. Every man has to do with a condition. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So they're all, God strives with all men. The Spirit of God convicts all men. The law written in their hearts in Romans 2 where it says their thoughts are the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. Every man has that. Every man has a conscience and every man deals with his thoughts accusing him or excusing him. Every man deals with the wrestling of is this right or is this wrong? Am I good or am I bad? Was that smart or was that stupid? Everybody has that capability. That's what makes you different from my cows. Okay? But the ones who have heard and have learned of the Father, there is a conditioning there. In other words, somewhere you make the choice to begin siding with right. There's a, there's a why in the road you side with right. There's a why in the road you side with what's just. There's a why in the road you side with God. And you began to condition your mind to side with truth, to side with what's right, to side with what's just, to side with what's biblical. And as you do that, you develop a habit that leads you to greater and greater truth and greater and greater light and the fact is, Jesus, from what he said here, says, you must meet Christ before you meet Christ. You must learn of Christ before you can learn of Christ. You must choose Christ before you even hear his call. 
Because you choose him by responding to the light that God puts on every man's path. You begin choosing Christ by siding with the right, by siding with truth, by siding with fairness, by siding with justice, by resisting evil, by resisting sin, by resisting darkness. And therefore, by the time you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, by the time you hear John the Baptist like these uh, disciples you're already programmed and conditioned in your own choices to side with that. Jesus had been watching these men. Peter was already becoming a stone. Nathaniel was already without guile. And when Jesus wanted to choose men to train for three and a half years to take the gospel around the world, to continue his work, to pour his spirit upon, to empower, and to write the scriptures. He's not going to choose men who have not been previously conditioned for righteousness. Now, one time Jesus said, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil. I'm not sure if he chose Judas just for the purpose of filling a role fulfilling scripture, that the scripture might be fulfilled. We got God, that's in the mind of God. He obviously knew the potential in that man. But Peter says that Judas, by transgression, fell. So we'll leave all the details to God. But the fact is, uh, Peter, James, and John, these people that he went after, he findeth Philip. Philip went and got Nathaniel. This was not uh, basically whoever wants to be a disciple, come over here, line up over here. It wasn't that way. And even though there are throngs and multitudes that followed him, when he went up into the Mount of Transfiguration, he let three men follow him. When he went into Jairus' house to raise the dead, he let three men follow him. Jesus was actually having a position of respect and authority among the disciples. And when they began to argue which of them would be the greatest, he put a stop to it. But he himself elevated certain ones in this uh, uh, system of discipleship. He had the twelve. He had the three. He had Peter uh, as a head apostle. When he met with them by the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection... He was addressing Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Feed my sheep. He didn't say that to anybody else there. So Jesus set it up the way he wanted to set it up, but he knew what he was doing. So the, the demeaning of these men only shows the elementary depravity of your mind. But what I want to get at is these three tests. Number one, the test of preparation. The test of Preconditioning. All right, young people, listen up. You are conditioning yourself to either be faithful or to fall away. Judas ended up where he had conditioned himself to end up. The first time he stole a little bit out of the bag, he was conditioning himself to become a thief and to be a traitor. And when your, your daily decisions, how you relate to mom and dad, how you obey, how you respect the church, how you listen in church, how you read your Bible, how you pray, you are conditioning yourself to become what you will become in your future. And God, the master of appropriateness, will see to it that you get whatever is appropriate to you now and in eternity. I mean, that, that would make me want to sit up. That would make me want to pay attention. That would make me want to humble down. That would make me want to read and pray and get myself out of the way. When Paul was preaching in Acts 13, verse 48, it says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the Calvinists jumped for joy, thinking they found something that supports their cause. But it does not. The word tasso, okay, is the same word in 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Same word. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves, tasso, 
to the ministry of the saints. What does that mean? They addicted themselves. They appointed themselves. They set themselves. They conditioned themselves to be ministers. And therefore, they became ministers because they set themselves toward it. That's what the word tasso means. All right? It's not unconditional election by the decree of God. This is preconditioning yourself, pre pre producing a disposition of determination. It's, a, it's, a, it's developed from your previous responses to light. So these Gentiles who had already been listening in at the synagogue, these Gentiles who already had a heart for the God of Israel, these Gentiles who were already in love with righteousness, who were already siding with God, who were already wanting God's way, when they heard the preaching of Paul and they realized the door was open to them, they believed. They walked through the door. Why? Because they were predisposed to eternal life. You're not going to make it to eternal life by conditioning yourself for hell. It doesn't work that way. They set themselves. They appointed themselves. They were determined. When their thoughts were the meanwhile accusing or excusing themselves, even when they didn't have the law of God, even when their conscience, by their conscience, they were a law unto themselves, they were gradually uh, gravitating to the light, gravitating to truth, gravitating to what was godly, gravitating to purity and away from corruption and away from depravity. And God sees that and he says, to him that hath shall more be given. But to him that hath not shall be taken away even that he had. So the first test is the test of preparation. These men already loved the Torah. Jesus said to the Jews, Had ye believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? It's the same voice. That's what Jesus meant when he said, my sheep hear my voice. That's what he's talking about. Um, Jesus was the essential topic of the Torah, of the Tanakh, what we call the Law and the Prophets, the Old Testament. If you have not believed his writings, you cannot believe my words, is what he was saying. If you have not embraced God's word in the Tanakh, in the Torah, you will not embrace God's word in the flesh. Had nothing to do with his personality or his occupation or his nationality. It had to do with that was the same voice that was coming through the Torah and uh, they read in the scriptures and they had not embraced it. They loved their religion, but they had not embraced God's law. When, when Philip found Nathaniel, he said, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Well, how do you know? He'd been reading it. They'd been studying it. They'd been looking for Jesus. They'd been looking for the Messiah of Israel. They knew the time was getting right. They could read Daniel, the 70 weeks of Daniel. They knew the time was ripe. They had been looking. They had probably been searching the scriptures. And when they met Jesus, they confidently said, We found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. In John 8, 31... Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye should be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed physically, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak with that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were, the, if ye were Abraham's children, spiritually, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. 
What's he basing all this on? The principle we just talked about. Okay? If you love God, you would love me. Jesus knew that. If you, if you had the heart of Abraham, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. Um, <clears throat> if God were your father, you would love me, for I pr proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth my he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. We can say the same thing today. Jesus said later on, uh, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. If you were of the world and you spake of the world, they would hear you. If you're of God and you speak of God, they're not going to hear you on the whole. There will be those who hear you, and those are the ones who are predisposed to eternal life. Why? Because as a little child, whether they were sitting in the Catholic Church or the Baptist Church or what, you know, wherever they were, if they were sitting with their daddy at the bar, they began a habit of siding with right, of siding with what was just, of, of, of hungering for God, of wondering about God. And when God showed in line of their path, they paid attention to it. And when they heard a gospel preached, their heart was drawn to it. And those little flickers of the thoughts accusing and excusing one another, when truth is presented, later on, the gospel's presented, and they take note, and they listen, and eventually, they come into the light. It's not due to predestination. It's due to our own conditioning in our own choices. And that in that same way, in that exact same way, you can be the child sitting in a biblical church, listening to godly preaching, listening to the Bible, while you're daydreaming about something ungodly, or you're daydreaming, daydreaming about something else, while you're shutting God off, while you're not paying attention, while you don't care, and you're developing an attitude of not caring about God, and not caring about truth, and not caring about the Holy Ghost, and you can go straight from a biblical church pew to hell. Right. The same way, the same principles apply. Jesus said to these same people, Ye believe not because you're not my sheep, as I said unto you, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They became his sheep prior to meeting him personally, by what I'm saying. The test of preparation, number one, side with God. Side with God's word. Side with God's truth. Learn his voice. Learn to obey his voice. Addict yourself to truth. Predispose yourself to righteousness. Then the next test. We're talking about finding a, a position like these guys got of usefulness, of blessing, God entrusting me with authority, God, God giving me a place in the church and me moving up to a place of prominence where people seek my counsel, where people respect my testimony, where people, uh, you know, if I, if I happen to be in the lot, they say he'd make a good minister. However that, or, or maybe he, she'd make a good minister's wife. How do you get there? Number one, the test of preparation you have to pass. Number two, the test of proving. 1 Timothy 3.10, And let these first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Okay, I've been a church member for three months. I want a position. Really? It's possible that in three months you have really shown incredible maturity, insight, dedication, and faithfulness. But don't expect to be put in a high position after three months. The proving we're talking about has to do with your life record. Okay? So there's people who show up here who have a terrible past. Next thing you know, they think they know it all. Before you know it, they think they're an authority. They're criticizing people who've been on the path for 
years and years and years, like, they, like there's some authority. It's like, hold it. That's called presumption. The voice of the church when it comes to choosing leaders is important. Look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. All right? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that last week you got converted and you've been zealous for a week. 2 Corinthians 8, 22, And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oft times proved diligent. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, But as we were, the word proved here is dokimazo, dokimazo. D-O-K-I-M-A-D-Z-O is the pronunciation with the accent on the D. Dokimazo, okay? And uh, if you're a Greek scholar here and I didn't say that just right, you can fill me in later. Dokimazo means to be proved. That means people are watching you. That means they're correcting you. That means they're holding you accountable. That means they're questioning you. That means that, uh, that they are expecting something out of you. Does that bother you? Does that kind of rub you the wrong way? You, know, you, should, you should just respect me without me having to prove myself. Oh, really? No, I'm sorry. In the church of Jesus Christ, it says here in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, but as we were allowed, same word, proved, of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but, of, but God which proveth, dokimadzo, our hearts. 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith, dokimadzo, that the tr proving of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be dokimadzo, with fire, proved, tested, tried, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but dokimadzo, the spirits. Prove them. Try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So you want to be, you want to be in a position of influence. You want the young ladies to respect you and to respect your opinion and to follow your example and you want the young men to think that you'll be a godly Christian wife someday. You got to pass the test of self-conditioning, preparation and proving. Young men, someday I want to be, you know, I want, I want to preach, I want the other young men to respect me, I want to, I want to have a godly influence, I want these young ladies to think that I'm going to be a man of God and therefore, if they want to serve God, they would be glad to, for me to ask them to court because he's a man of God. You want, you want that kind of reputation? You want to be used of God in a special way? You need to think about your daily self-conditionings, your daily choices, your daily preparation, and the proving. Expect it. Don't expect to be entrusted without being tried. Don't expect to be given a place of authority and respect until you've been proved. The third test you gotta pass, and this test is not before you get a position, but before you get a crown. It's a test of perseverance. We already mentioned that Judas may have started out really well. Somewhere he began to condition himself and prepare himself for failure. Someday, somewhere along the line, possibly previous to Jesus calling him, most likely, there was a, a self-conditioning for self-justification, a self-conditioning for self-pampering, a self-conditioning for self-preservation, and it led to him being a traitor. Can you imagine being one of the 12 and being known for eternity as the one who betrayed the Son of God? He never dreamed when he started out that that's where it would go. All those little choices conditioned him to that end. The test of perseverance. A bad ending can ruin many years of faithfulness, labor, and sacrifice. You can, you can be so diligent and careful for so many years and do a lot of good. And then you can blow it. 
And even though maybe the books you wrote and the messages you preached were good, but once they hear what you did, they don't want to listen to it. They don't want to read your book. They don't want to hear your sermon. I've known some preachers that way. Sad. None of us are safe from that. But our daily choices are conditioning us for victory or failure. Our daily conditioning. We're siding with God against evil or we're justifying sin and justifying our flesh. A great ending is far more important than a great start. You may start out terrible. The guy that wrote Amazing Grace, a number of the hymn writers, a number of great preachers of the past started out as a, a wicked sinner. But when they repented, they totally did a 180. And whatever conditioning they had entertained before, they rejected it, they renounced it, and they began to pursue God with all their heart. And they had a glorious ending. Conversion is a dumping of the previous conditioning, a rejecting, a renouncing, a declaration of war, and a turning around and pursuing God and siding with God and changing that. It's a possibility. In Philippians 2.20, Paul says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ." But you know the proof, the dokimazo, <laughs> sorry about that, um, what was it, dokimazo, yeah, I switched that around, dokimazo, you know the proof of him that as a son with the father, talking about Timothy, he has served with me in the gospel. Now, Timothy had developed a testimony working side by side closely with Paul that he really cared about the work, the name of God, vindication of God's word. But Paul saw a lot of other people who were working around him in, the, in Christianity. And Paul said there's a difference. And what the difference is, these people are really concerned about themselves. Self-preservation, self-advancement, uh, their name, their reputation. They're not just concerned about the work and righteousness and truth. Do you know that you can seek your own through religion? You can be good just so you look good. You can try to be humble just so you look good. You want to develop a good name. Why? So I want people to admire me. You can seek your own. Judas may have spent a lot of time doing that. The other disciples said, is it I? Is it I? They didn't say, oh, it's probably Judas. He had them fooled. He didn't have Jesus fooled, but he had, he had the rest of them fooled. They didn't, they didn't say, oh, it's Judas. The test of perseverance is the test of how you carry and hold the position you're entrusted with. Once you gain a position of influence, of authority, of respect, your perseverance in holiness and your perseverance and good stewardship uh, is a great test. The test of time will show you eventually bowing to keep your position, eventually becoming partial in your judgment to preserve yourself, eventually compromising God's word and God's program to keep your numbers and your prestige. I know, I know a lot of preachers that I've met over the time, over my lifetime. They're not stupid. Why they're still preaching what they're preaching tells me they've closed some doors to greater light. I've heard preachers say concerning divorce and remarriage, I heard a bishop of a Mennonite church say concerning those divorced and remarried people, uh, what would happen if we let those people in? So he's not seeking truth, he's seeking his own. I've heard, I've talked to Mennonite men who said, yeah, but we don't want to make waves, we don't want to rock the boat, it's hard to keep these, these communities together. He's seeking his own, not the things which be Jesus Christ. 
I've heard people say things that are so easy to disprove, like, endure to the end is, was only for the Jews. O only for the Jews in the tribulation period. Really? When did you learn to read? Oh, that person, that person is not stupid. They just took a position that preserves their, their place, their prestige. They're not being totally honest with the Word of God. I know another preacher who was confronted about head covering, and he honestly told the man, if we enforce head covering, we'll split the church. He's seeking his own. I talked to a preacher over by Macon one day about why in their, their doctrine that they, they didn't have head coverings because they believed that the covering was women's uncut hair. And yet in their church, all the women cut and permed their hair. I said, so how does that fit? Well, he said, I believe that let every man be persuaded in his own mind. He's seeking his own. I told him, I said, oh, so I could come to your church and take communion and be a homosexual as long as I'm persuaded in my own mind? He said, well, now you're pushing me. Yeah, he's seeking his own. When you're seeking your own, don't expect a crown. Perseverance means that you don't compromise the word. Perseverance means when everyone else quits, you're still running. When everyone else surrenders, you're still fighting. When everyone else compromises, you're still faithful, even if you're the only one left. Do you want a place of service? In verse 5, well, we, we're going to draw it to a close. The test of personal preparation, the test of proving, training, correction, accountability, the test of perseverance. Are you concerned about his program or your own? We'll move on to verse 5 next week. Let's stand together. I want to challenge you this morning. These apostles, these men were just men, but they weren't just men. They were just human beings, but they weren't just men. God had been watching from the time they were your age, from the time they were Isaac's age, from the time they were Maribeth's age. He'd been watching them for a long time. He saw them sit in synagogue. He saw them in the temple as they grew up. He saw their heart. He saw whether they were siding with God or siding with self-justification. And when Jesus was tempted of the devil and he came back through and John said, Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus knew who were going to be his disciples. It was these guys, this group of guys. By the way, this group of guys knew each other. When they saw the Messiah, I got I to gotta tell Peter. I got to tell Nathaniel. I got to tell Andrew. We got to go tell James. What did they know about each other? That they were all preconditioned to follow the Messiah. There was a lot of people they knew that they didn't go tell. Because they knew they really wouldn't, they didn't, they didn't get it. They, didn't, they wouldn't be the ones who would understand. So when you start thinking about the apostles and who these men were and how greatly God used them, and I would like to be used, I want you to keep those three tests in mind because they apply to us today. Any thoughts from the brethren? Well, I appreciated the thoughts there about John the Baptist. He wasn't just used to speak to the nation. He was used to would you say be a part of the sifting process of, of selecting people whom Jesus was going to appoint to be you know, his disciples? Um, 
Yes. That's what he was there with the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Obviously, if you if you care anything about preparing for the Lord, you're going to respond to John. Yeah, there's a reason why the ones who crucified Jesus hadn't listened to John either. And there's a reason you made mention about the disciples knew who to go talk to. Well, yes, wasn't it Anna too? And she, she spake of him to all them to look for redemption in Jerusalem there. She knew. Right. There was people she knew would have interest in such news. So I guess the question is, if someone among us uh, heard some great news like Anna did or like Simeon did or like uh, John and Andrew did, would they, would they come and tell you? Would they know that she would want to know, he would want to know, I got to go tell so-and-so. Are you in that group? That's a good question for us to ask ourselves. Yeah, I appreciate the proper um, understanding of the character of the men that Jesus chose. There's so much, yeah. um, so many people want to make it, and it's, it, I view it as purely wanting to make people feel good. If God can use them, he can use you, you know. Uh, and I specifically heard a conservative minister saying, now Peter was, he was a rough character. If Jesus could use him, don't be discouraged, he can use you. He was a rough character. He was probably the rough, one of the rough ones. And, and, and really demeaned him, in my opinion, quite a bit. And I feel like there's t it just, it's hard to listen to um, <clears throat> quietly. But um, I, I feel like it's just to try to make people, make a rough character feel like, you're as good as Peter, God can use you too. Instead of using the fact that Jesus in his wisdom chose men of great character and you need to become a man of character so God can use you. Right. And it takes away teeth like that and it's it really frustrating. And um, I like to hear it put properly. Because what does he mean by Peter was a rough character? When Peter had that vision, he said nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But he wasn't. He wasn't a, a law-breaking Jew. He was a very law-abiding Jew. So where's the rough character part? He took they, facts about their stuff, their time with Jesus, and picked and, and distorted it just a little bit, and kind of, kind of threw a little bit of this. How he would have this? I suspect this is probably what that happened there. Peter was probably behind this, and, and and went through that, and kind of created a rough character based on a mistake here and there that was recorded by them. Yeah. And um, I don't think he did it in a, in a malicious way, but I think that he was being used to, to distort, a, a, give a very bad view of some of the me best men that ever lived on the earth. And I think it's not, and I don't appreciate that, but that's not just to one person. A lot of people do that to the apostles mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. To encourage the rebel. Yeah, to exactly. To encourage rebels that, that uh, you're, you're not so bad. It can also encourage laziness because <clears throat> when it's when it's time for me for God to use me, He'll come and He'll make me what I need to be. Instead of you need to be preparing, and then whenever when you're doing your best, He'll fill in what you can't do and He'll empower you. But it gives the implication that I don't need to be trying to prepare. And if He if He has a job for me, He'll on the spot make me what I need to be so I can do that job. The reality is, you, you take people of the highest character today and you put on them the power that Peter had, where they brought people out on the streets and the shadow could overshadow. I mean, power to raise people from the dead. Most men of the highest character today would totally wash out and not be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. so, let's pray.